Welcome to Barley and Hops. Hey, today's topic is going to be hops. We're going to try to demystify hops. Beer is made with water, grain, yeast, and hops. Those are your four basic ingredients. We spend a lot of time on water. We spend a lot of time on the grains and the adjuncts and what we add to our beer. We spend a lot of time talking about the different characteristics and strains of yeast. We spend little time trying to understand the value and what hops bring to our beer. So we're going to try to demystify that for you today. Let's start by showing you what hops look like. Normally when hops come in, they're, well, they grow in a cone, but they're processed and for our use as home brewers and even for commercial brewers, a lot of times we'll use pellet hops. And the pellet hops are just really processed because if you're going to use, as an example, this is a one ounce bag of hops. And in a one ounce bag of hops, in order to use enough cones or fresh hops or the hop leaves in order to get the same alpha acid level, and we'll get to that, that you would out of one ounce of hops, you'd have to use a, what I call a buttload uh, of uh, hop cones or the leaves uh, because they have to extract those alpha acids from there. That's, the that's what the processing does. But what they do is they turn out to be a hop pellet, which are is universally used in the brewing industry, especially for home brewers, and it looks like little rabbit food. Uh, they're small pellets. Uh, they're, oh, some of them are about a quarter inch long, and they're a little green. Some are a little darker, some are a little bit lighter, but it all depends on their content. So that's what you've got. You've got hot pellets, and that's an ounce of hot pellets, and they will, they will go a long way. Now look, our, uh, our, our processors uh, package hops in many different ways. We carry them in here. You've got a gold pack. Uh, then we've got the new BSG. Uh, came out with a new marketing strategy, so they, they've changed the, uh, the design of their packets, so they look like this. What you need to know about hops is what hops actually do to your beer. Hops are first a bitter. They give you the bittering flavor. They also add to the aroma and the character and the mouthfeel of your beer, but also hops is a preservative. Have you ever heard the term IPA, the India Pale Ale? Well, let's explain the difference between a standard English ale and an IPA. Years and years ago when they were shipping their beer down to India, the beer started to go sour and go bad. It would stay all on the way. Well, what happened was is the brewer decided to double the amount of hops that he put in the beer, thus making an India Pale Ale. What they found was, they found was the introduction of additional hops with a high alpha acid level actually preserved the beer. So if you get it, that is called an IPA, the India Pale Ale. A lot of people like that high hoppy atmosphere in their beer. Uh, of course, if you drink it in Great Britain, it's going to be an Imperial Pale Ale. So just, just a good tidbit of information and history for you. But that's where the IPA came from. Now, they list these uh, by alpha acid level. And you'll notice on the packet, and I hope you can see that, uh, this is just a simple, this is a Tetanang hop. It's a dual purpose hop. Its alpha acid level is 3.8%. Each one of these have a different alpha acid level, and I'm going to show you all of these in just a moment, but let's talk about what the alpha acid level is. The alpha acid level will change every year through every crop of these hops as they're produced. So you're, if you wind up this year with a 3.8%, this may be a 4.7 next year, it may be a 2.9 next year, but very rarely will it be the same each and every year. That's why we have this thing we call alpha acid units, an, an AAU. That's one of the ways, there's, there's many different ways of, of measuring the bitterness in your beer or the hop additions. AAUs, or alpha acid units, in home brewing is probably the most, uh, most universal. Then there's the IBUs, the international bittering units. Please don't confuse the two. The international bittering units is a score used to score the final product and it ranges from zero to 100. There are some that they, that they exceed the scale. You've got some IPAs that'll go as high as 145, but that's an extended scale. Alpha acid units are, as an example, this would be 3.8 alpha acid units, one ounce of 3.8% alpha acid. So this is 3.8 alpha acids, or alpha acid units. So if you were looking for what's that, six, 7.6 uh, alpha acid units, you would use two ounces of the Tetanang hop. Does that make sense? 
It's pretty simple and pretty straightforward. Now, if you want to understand or you want to know what your international bittering units are, which are your final product, the bitterness of your beer, uh, I, I'd recommend you just go, look, there is a formula for this, but this is not a scientific program. And, and I'm not going to go through a litany of, uh, of uh, scientific calculations because it takes into consideration, first of all, your alpha acid units, the amount of the size of your wort, whether that's a three, four, or five gallon wort, the t uh, time of the uh, boil, and the gravity of the beer. And all of those, and there are constants in there, but that's how you figure out the international bittering units. The best way to do it, just go to Brewtoad or some of those other programs that you already have on your computer and you, you can figure it out easy. You'll just put in your alpha acid levels and the amount of time that you boil because it, time has a big influence on your international bittering units. And that'll give you the international bittering units at the end. So let's talk about international bittering units for just a second because your standard beers, let's take a Miller Lite or a Keystone or somewhere under 10. Man, maybe eight, nine, some, sometimes 10. Uh, then you start to move up the scale in that bittering unit and you'll start to move into things like Heineken, which is about a 20, 25 or so. Then you, your Sam Adams Boston Lagers, uh, anywhere from 30 to 40. So you, you understand where I'm getting? You, you, you can, if, if you've had these different types of beers and you've tried them, you'll understand what I'm talking about. Your international bittering units start to rise. Of course, those become craft beers and they're a little bit more expensive. Now, here's what we have. We've got, have you heard the term noble hops? The noble hops are Tetnang and Hallertau, both products of Germany, and they're called noble hops because they're sort of like the grandfathers of the hops. And hops grow on a band on the northern portion of the earth, all the way around the earth. They're, that's that's the, the growing season or growing geographic area for hops. So they're really, really abundant in those areas. So we've got hops from product of the United States. We've got cluster hop pellets. Uh, we've got Cascade. This is probably the most popular hops in, uh, in America. Almost all American beers have a Cascade in them somewhere. Uh, then you've got Galena. Galena hops are also a product of the United States, which means they're grown and they're processed in the United States. We have Fugel. Fugel hops is a very, very popular hops. It's a product of the United Kingdom. Oh, let's see here. We've got Saz. Saz is an alpha acid, 3.7. So this is 3.7 AAUs, alpha acid units. And this is a product of the Czech Republic. And then we have Styrian Golden. Styrian Golden is a product of Slovenia. So you'll see that they come from all over the world and they're all packaged about the same way, but they all have different characteristics and different flavors, depending on what you want to do with your beer. Now, <coughs> we, we come to the point where some, some producers will label them as bittering hops or aroma hops. And then some will also label them as dual purpose hops. Here's the rule of thumb. All hops can be used as either bittering or aroma. The real function of that is how long do you boil them? And if you boil them for the full 60 minutes, trust me, they're going to be a bittering hop. If you only boil them for the last 5 to 10 minutes, chances are they're an aroma hop. So it takes a long time. And scientifically, you're only going to get about 30% efficiency out of the hops in the first place. If you want to get all of that efficiency out of those hops, um, because what you're doing is you're taking, you're extracting the oils out of hop pellets and you're trying to combine them with the molecules inside of your wort, which is, you know that oil and water does not mix. Therefore, that's why you have the rapid boil that goes on in your wort. And that's so that you have, they call it isomerization, so that these oils are isomerized into the molecules inside your wort. And that's why gravity has such an effect on it, wort volume has an effect on it, and then time of the boil has such an effect on it in order to achieve your international bittering units. So I offer that to you. Uh, these are all very, very good hops. Uh, some go well, with, uh, better with others. Uh, some do not mix completely. Uh, you know, are they you know, sort of like apples and oranges? Uh, you you want to keep them separate? Uh, we, can't, we have a book inside in, in our shop and uh, we, we list everything we can about the hop so that you can look at the hop and decide if that's what you want to do and that's the type of flavor profile or characteristic you're trying to follow or if that's what you want to introduce into your beer. 
Uh, this one in particular is a challenger hop. It's a versatile kettle hop, can be used late or as a dry hop. So you don't have to boil, you can use it. And if, remember, if you're using it as a dry hop, it's probably going to be an aroma hop. Although full advantage is not taken of its high alpha content. Okay, it has a fruity scent with spicy overtones and combines well with other English hops to create a more sophisticated profile. So we've got all this information laid out, and you can find this on the internet. You can find it just about anywhere. Look, visit us on www.barleyandhopsbrewing.com. Give us a call. Uh, we talk about hops all the time. Uh, most of our brewers are really, really knee-deep into the process and the science behind it, and they make some very, very good beers. So I'll leave you with that. Cascade is the most popular for the U.S. Fugel is probably the most popular in the United Kingdom. And, of course, you have your noble hops, the Tetanang and the Hallertau. We'll see you on the next edition. Thank you.